Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now you're welcome along. Very happy to say Keith Wood with this evening. Good evening, Joe. How are you? Very well. Let's start with Leinster 16, Munster 6. It was uh, more comprehensive, I think, than the scoreline suggests. I was going to say, do we have to start with that? You know, to start middle and end with it, I suppose. Um, it could have been 20 points of, of, of a difference or even 25. Um, I thought Leinster were very impressive, were consistently impressive. Um, they made a few mistakes uh, when they were close to the line, which isn't like them. And I think left Munster off the hook maybe four or five occasions in the game. So um, like Munster were dogged and stuck into a lot and got back to half time. But Leinster were, um, were in total control of the game. Yeah, demoralising is the word I'm hearing most about how Munster will feel about this because of the nature of the performance and the gap. Yeah, demoralising, dispiriting, there's a whole variety of different words that you can stick into it. For me, um, what I found very upsetting really was um, the lack of nuance in the game from the, the, the same game at the end of last season. You know, the, the, or the, the semi-final of the, the game in, in the uh, in the first lockdown period. Um, I didn't feel the monster um, fired a shot again, you know, and um, I just thought that, do you know what? I think over the last few weeks, because we were getting a, a little bit upset with Ireland for the fact that Ireland were playing with no pace whatsoever, um, weren't putting anything onto the ball, were kicking away too much ball, and it was becoming very frustrating watching Ireland play like that, and then they go and play um, against England with a lot of pace and a lot of zip and attack the gain line and and even when they were kicking it it was a really quick kick and I just felt once we were going to do more of that I, I, I had hoped that we wouldn't revert back to, to slow play but it, that's all it was slow it down kick it up in the air and Leinster's back three were very good in it and um, again I just it's impossible to get any momentum if you keep kicking the ball away. Like, if you kick it away and get it back, then there's a chance. But for the most part, I felt Munster just kicked the ball away uh, with abandon. And do you think that was very much their game plan or was it Leinster pressure which left them feeling maybe they had no option? Um, I, I, it looked like the game plan. I, I don't know, but um, if, if I was being honest, I would have said two weeks previously, Ireland's game plan was to do something very similar. Um but the week in between showed what can happen if if you just get the ball off the deck really quickly. Mm. And um, for me, it looked like it was being slowed down. There just didn't seem to be any invention. No, I think Leinster's defence was excellent. I thought their pressure was excellent as it was supposed to be. You know, they're, they're a top team. So they put Munster under pressure all the time. But Munster, Munster didn't really look like they wanted to do anything else with it. So um, for me, it's just very disappointing. And they do have the talent to do more with it, don't they? I mean, you look at the likes of Earls and Conway on the wings, you look at Carberry back in the team, you look at Dale a World Cup winner in there, Farrell has a skill set. Like, there's plenty of operators there. Ty Byrne, we know what he can do. We've seen him do it in a green shirt with the ball in his hands. I mean, there's enough there to do something. Look, I think if, if you look back, and I don't want to keep harking back to uh, the Irish game, but I will just once more sure. in, in this... Um, when you take it flat, when you attack the game line, when you're trying to speed it up an awful lot more, I think you have a better chance and a better opportunity to do it. I think Munster have a decent back line. Um, I thought the Leinster uh, front row put Munster under huge pressure. Um, the Leinster packed it, and um, which is probably the most, the hardest thing really is the old Munster's Munster, which would have been the old Munster way of trying to do it against Leinster. Mm. Leinster did that. I thought Rullock was fantastic, uh, but so many players were fantastic in the pack. Um, uh, I still think it was a bit of a rush putting Carberry back in. He played very, very little. I thought he stuck to it manfully, put under a huge amount of pressure, targeted consistently, which yeah. is what you're supposed to do. That's not a criticism. You're supposed to target a guy who's only coming back into it. Um, uh, for me, Ty Byrne looked shattered after the Six Nations. And, um, you know, when you're having to fight for every single moment and every single minute, I think it makes it very hard. He hasn't played a huge amount of of international rugby when he is being one of the main men. And he was, you know, Ireland's, I would say, Ireland's best player of the Six Nations. And 
Um, and it looked like he'd come down off that and it was hard to get back up to it. And, and um, look, our, our, like Munster were in, were in at half time, having had no possession, no territory, had somehow managed to get themselves back to six all, which I, and I thought was a really intriguing first half. I, I mean, there were mistakes, but you know, when a team is hanging on and you think they're hanging on, you say, God, get to half time and see what happens. Munster did all that. But it unravelled in, in, for the most part in the second half. Alan Quinlan was on with the lads this morning on OTBAM. He echoed your point about the battle up front. He said, "Rugby's never going to change. You know, ultimately, if you lose that battle, you're going to struggle to win the game." And they did lose that battle, and they lost it badly. Is that that tight fives ceiling? Is that just where they are? Um, I don't know if it's their ceiling. I, I. You know, you have to play at the top of your game playing against Leinster. Like there are comments that come out after the game to say Leinster are ahead of uh, the, the, everybody else, and it's very tough. Blah blah blah. Of course, that's true. That's entirely true. But you have to raise your game first. Um, you have to try and control as much of it as you possibly can. Um, um, I think that uh, I think they struggled because, like, it's really interesting. I, I've. I, I know Stuart Lancaster comes in for most of the plaudits with Leinster. Um, I think that's unfair. Um, I think Leo Cullen is doing a fairly masterful job at the moment in keeping a huge amount of players energised to play just on enough edge when they're, you know, when they don't get a run, that's when they do get a run, they cause carnage. So, um, look, Everybody's been wishing for for Furlong to get back and to play, and then he's shown what we're missing when he came back, and he was fantastic. But Porter took that almost as a personal affront, and it didn't matter who was going to be opposite him. I just thought he played, you know, he played his socks off, and uh, you know, I, I actually thought the the whole front row, Keen Healy was was great, and Kelleher. Um, look, I want to see Kelleher play and play and play. I want yeah. to see him iron out the kinks in his line out throwing of which he has a couple and um, sometimes they just drift off to the right a little and there's things he can do to tidy that up and um but i think what he offers around the field is just fantastic and if you're to talk about almost the difference between um between him and scandal as a, a view of the game you would say that keller is about power and pace and scandal is about carrying you know they're like heavy hits, but there's no, they're not powerful. They're not fast. There isn't an opportunity of it becoming an offload or going five or ten yards over the game line. Mm. Um, and that kind of that just shows the way the game was. There was a higher sense of of power in um, <clears throat> in Leinster's performance. And if you look at the look, I thought Gavin uh, um, Coombs. I I think he's been really good all season. I thought he's been fantastic all season. Um, and I thought he was very good again, though not as conspicuous as you'd normally see him, because they were almost beaten down, you know, with the tight five under pressure. And I thought Reese Ruddock was was incredible. Mm. And I, I think he has to be the most unlucky guy uh, in around to Irish teams because his level of performance is consistently at a really high level. And he's a big unit. You know, we don't have too many huge units in, in Ireland. He's a big unit. He did, he's a wrecking ball. To give people who maybe didn't see the game a sense of the domination in that first half, I was taking notes as I was going. I mean, first 10 minutes, I don't think Munster had the ball. You know, I remember Liam Toland on commentary saying, well, Munster don't have possession or territory. They're going to have to change one of those things pretty quickly. And they couldn't really. And they got lucky uh, on the sixth minute when O'Loughlin botched that pass to Larmer in a 2v1 after, like, brilliant play. I mean, some of Leinster's play was, was great, you know. And then... 25 minutes, you mentioned Porter. He, I mean, he had a lovely little pop pass out the back and it ends up again. O'Loughlin, I think, to Larmer. It was another certain try almost. A minute later, Scott Fardy is held up by Coombs and Stander. And then on 32 minutes, van der Fleer makes this great break and Keenan's off his shoulder and then Henshaw's off his shoulder and it looks like big trouble and Keith Earls can't believe his luck when the ball is passed to him and Munster get off again. But it was like relentless from Leinster. Admittedly, their forward pack, as you've detailed, gave them a great platform. But man, they went about their business with Panache. Well, as I said, they could have they could have scored an awful lot more. They were held up over the line. I mean, I think a lot of it's funny, this is and this is worrying for me. So there was an awful lot of missed tackles in the first half. Thirty five in total. I don't know how many were in the first half, but 35, yeah. 35 missed tackles in total. 
it's very hard to play when that happens, and um, which means that at times the defence got very narrow. I think Dialende got cut out a couple of times um, in defence just by people staying very close to him. So I, I, I thought Munster got very narrow in defence. The offloads put you under pressure when you're on your the, the, the back foot, you're under pressure all the time. But the scramble defence was fantastic. So the scramble defence with the guys getting in underneath the ball, Keith Earls, I don't think he was surprised. I think he ran into that position because there was a huge overlap. And um, and he snaffled that ball in the middle of their back line. There was no offside from that particular point. But um, I again, I thought Leinster were a little bit rusty, as you expect, actually, players coming in, coming out. Um, if they had scored those, I, I, I'd be afraid to see what could have happened, yeah. you know. And uh, so for that, it was, that's what I'm saying. I thought the first half was really intriguing. I, mm. They were played off the park and it was level. That's a great place to be when you're going in and say, okay, we know we have to change things around and we have to get things better. But I, for the life of me, when you get the ball, having not had the ball, don't kick it away. Yeah. And I understand that Ross Byrne is stroking the ball beautifully from 50 yards and that that is a risk all the time. But I, I, I just, I think the game has moved away from that. I think there's a time and a place for it. It can't be, it can't be pretty much the only option. Mm. Or the, the second option, one out carriers. It just, it, it, there needs to be more. And I know there's a huge amount of pressure and I know that that makes it very, very difficult, but mm. there has to be more in the locker. Yeah. So Munster's points in the first half, yeah, Jean Klein made that great hit on Keane Healy after 12 minutes and it felt like maybe, OK, a bit of a momentum changer and it just didn't happen. There was a yeah. moment where Farrell threw the ball out over the sideline on 17 minutes and that contributed to their 10 turnovers across the game. But as you said, six all at half time. So that's where you're kind of thinking, OK, coaching ticket. You've played Leinster a lot. There was the Aviva match you mentioned in the semi-final uh, back towards the end of last year. There was the match at Thomond, which was far more competitive. You know, you're fairly familiar with what Leinster are about. You're seeing what they're doing today. This is your 15, 16 minutes with the team to try and change fortunes somehow. And did Munster come out with a different game plan in any way? Did they try and do anything uh, different? I know Conan scored relatively early in that second half and once Leinster go score two in front it gets very tricky admittedly but did you see any change after half time? Um, not much. Um, I do think the Conan try which was again a fine it was a fine finish from an awful lot of heavy hitting play um, I think that knocked, knocked the stuffing out of Munster because yeah. they needed to score first and you, like you'll, you'll often talk in the change room about okay we get on the score sheet now we're the ones who make the first one we we um we we put ourselves into a stronger position we put the pressure on them the yeah. pressure had been on monster for 40 minutes in, in its entirety they hadn't put leinster under pressure for 40 minutes it, it was it's one of those strange occasions that it would be half or, or um, the six all at half time. It just was strange, but um, but they they had not been in control of the game, and um, within four or five minutes, um, Leinster were had just scored to try to put them a, a good bit out of, out of the way, and I think that took an awful lot out of them. Oh, it felt like game over, didn't it? Yeah, it no, it did. I mean, it like you always think with with. You always think with Munster that you can always get back in to do something, but you have to you have to play. You know, it isn't about flashing the ball to to the wingers. It's, but it is about getting far more involved. Mm. I just felt that Munster didn't seem to be that involved. They started running the ball. Um, I, I heard uh, Van Gran had a comment saying, "Look, when they tried to rush it with five minutes to go, they were put under huge pressure. That's not the time to do it. Like that's." That's that's a hail mary um, where you're trying to run it from 95 yards to score, and you're saying yeah they keep pushing us back. Of course they're pushing you back. They've got all the energy. Um, you, you know you've been the one defending for the whole thing. You have to do that earlier in the game. That can't be the only option, and that can't be the line that you use either. So um, look, I, for me it just started drifting um, in the second half. Yeah, um, you could see. Some guys were rusty. Um, some guys just didn't play as well as they can play. Some were almost beaten into submission, you know. And 
that's a, that's not a nice place to be. And I've played in those matches, so this is not as if these things don't happen during yeah. your career. They do happen, and um, but you need to be saying, look, there has to be more in the team. We have to be able to do more. We have to take a risk. We have to have a spark of creativity. We have to show something beyond one out runners and kicking the ball in the air. And for me, that's what makes the most disappointing. Yeah. And that big picture of you, I suppose, before we look ahead to Toulouse and maybe talk a bit about Leinster as well, is that there was a real sense from you and from lots of people after that semi-final at the Aviva late last year that, right, this game plan can't happen again. I mean, it's just not going to work. And then I thought there was a bit of hope amongst uh, the Munster fraternity after the game at Thomond, you know, real sense that the gap is uh, closing. So maybe that's why it's so demoralising in a way, the nature of that performance on Saturday, because... It's a fairly tuttering reality check. You know, whatever sense there was that the gap is closing, I think is gone now. That was a little reminder to everybody that the gap is as big as it's ever been. And it's very hard for Munster to say it's not. Yeah, well, I would say the gap could even be um, bigger than it had been mm. because, um, again, I go back to Leo Cullen. He was shrewd in how he picked which players to come back onto the field and um, which guys were coming back from Ireland duty to go straight into the team or not into the team. And what he did have was a bench that would just frighten the life out of anybody who played 60 minutes to see these guys coming on afterwards, um, like a, a clutch of, of lions to come on to finish the game. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I thought he managed it really well, but I also thought that he gave, um, he had courage of his convictions and he gave the sense of squad a really good Philip by saying the people who've got us here, who've played in a lot of these matches, get the chance to do it again. And they get the chance to play in the big in the big games. That's a there's a great sense of purpose in that squad because sure. of that, you know. Where does it leave this coaching ticket then? And I admit, you know, clearly we're not even we have to see what happens in Europe. That's going to be fairly crucial but you know they've they've spent money they brought in Larkham they bring in Graham Rentree they go and sign two World Cup winners and they back Van Graan here uh, his his stock at the moment Keith in your eyes are you worried? Um, I'd say I'd say he's feeling pretty vulnerable this week now and I, he has got one of the biggest weeks ahead of him um, as to how Munster will respond and play this weekend because um you know, when you're when you're trying to win trophies, these are the these are the ones that count. I actually think they've managed to blood a lot of players during the year. Some of that was uh, due to COVID and to different circumstances and injury, um, but they still have done it. So there there is a sense that there are more players coming through the system. Um, it's taken a while to get there, and they have got there to this point. Uh, they need to be trying to to win these these competitions for me I would have said the match of the weekend was it was was one that they didn't have to worry about getting up for and yet that didn't seem to happen too much so the fear for me when I look at, at Munster for this weekend is I too have a, have a proud history and they have an ability they're one of the few French teams that actually still take their form away from home I love the idea of playing in Ireland or England trying to get a result. They have that capacity. They have a beast of a front row. If they pick the front row that they, they can, they put us under a fair amount of pressure. They've got pace all over the field. They have skill all over the field. Mm. Um, if if Munster don't stop them and Munster don't score you know, themselves in the first 20, 25 minutes, it can be an incredibly hard day because you, you can be chasing ghosts following Toulouse if the weather is, is right for them, if they get the bounce of the ball at the start. You just don't want them to have any confidence and you need to be able to build your confidence. It's a hard team to build your confidence against. Yeah, no, it sure is. I know you're on commentary for that game yeah. uh, with Neil. We have the Leinster game live as well. Uh, Johnny Murphy's alongside Neil for that. That's on the uh, Friday evening. Interesting to see. So JJ Hanrahan has uh, departed as well, as has Darren Sweetenham. Sweetenham's gone to La Rochelle as medical cover for this season. JJ Hanrahan's moving to Claremont on a one-year deal. Uh, Van Gran was putting this down to the financial impact of COVID. He was saying due to the challenges stemming from the COVID landscape, we're not in a position to hold on to a player of JJ's calibre. We're sorry to see him go. 
Uh, what's your read on that move and that situation? Is it as he explained or have they looked at Healy and Carberry and said, look, JJ, it hasn't maybe quite worked out the way we'd hoped, so we're, we're happy enough to let you go? Or will they be very sorry to see him go? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. I, I, I think at times um, JJ has proven to be um, um, a very serious operator um, at slightly lower level. So he, he goal kicks brilliantly. He has played very well in Pro 14 consistently. He has struggled at times, but if we're looking at it now, Munster have struggled at semi-finals and finals for quite a while now. Um, the Claremont game offered something very different mm. to see that he could have clutch kicks from, from afar and do all the things he needed to do to coast a team home. Um, I think there is a reality that we're going to see over the next period of time in terms of um, players being kept or not kept and the length of their deals is there's a doubt as to the, um, the, the amount of money that's going to be floating around in the system because if until people start coming back into games again all rugby clubs are losing money. It doesn't matter. You, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter in what league you are. If you don't have people coming into the ground, you're losing money. You're still having yeah. to pay wages. So, look, there are a, a variety of young tens coming through the system. Uh, we've seen little bits and bobs of them with um, um, uh, with with Healy, with Crowley, with um, with Flannery coming through. So there are those um, those options there mm. and. I think these will be the decisions that are going to be made going forward. Yeah. That, uh, that that's where some of the changes will be. You can kind of forget just because we've got all very used to no crowds there and it, you know used to it in TV that the bank balance hasn't got used to it at all. Far from it. Our uh, rugby coverage and off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone official sponsors of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. On Leinster, they've Toulon, which is a less tricky assignment. It seems Toulon are uh, slightly worried about relegation in France at the moment, and obviously they're not the force of old. Worth mentioning, though, Johnny Sexton and Ross Byrne, both injury concerns. Ross Byrne with his knee, I think we saw that at the weekend. and uh, Johnny Sexton went off for uh, HIA, so he has gone through the return-to-play protocols, as he was during the Six Nations, uh, which would mean after... <laughs> I don't know how many months of talk about Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne might find himself in a big knockout European game all of a sudden on Friday. Yeah, and I think he'll do fine. I think Harry Byrne's a fine player. I think he he's at ups and downs. He needs to have both of them to understand how he responds to those sort of things. Um, uh, yeah, and and you maybe have Kieran Frawley um, uh, in the background as well. Yeah. So I look Leinster have strength and depth in that position. And it's funny, <clears throat> Ireland rely far more on Johnny Sexton than Leinster do. Hmm. Um, they have a lot more players at, at Heineken Cup level or Pro 14 level that are able to step up to it. Um, it is harder the higher up you go and it's much harder in international. But they do have players who are well able to go and do it. So, yeah. I, I, look, you're, you're sharing the load um, as opposed to having everything run through you. So that I think... Look, I don't have any fear for, for Leinster in that tie. I think it'll be a tough tie, um, but they'll be gunning for it because now they've got this um, this trophy done. Mm. Um, that was something that, that would have been, you know, they just would not have wanted to fall down over the weekend. They wouldn't never give a sucker an even break, as they say, and they wouldn't have wanted Munster to have got anywhere near um, that game. So that is a decent pressure off them. I think they can... They can be a little bit liberated by that too, and uh, and see where they see where they get to. Mm. It's uh, to their credit they don't get much credit for winning a fourth Pro 14 in a row because they're just so far they ahead. Great, of they get everybody. great credit. They don't. They, get great they credit. don't. We we started well, we started with Munster. You know, really. No, we, we did. We, we started with Munster because Mon the Munster was the story. But the credit. That's the point. Uh, that's the point. Yeah, that the, the winners yeah. are not the story anymore because they've done it for the fourth time in a row. Yeah, I, do you know what, I, I'm, um, as, a, as a Munsterman, I'm going to fight Leinster's cause on this one. I think they've brought an awful lot of players through the system in the last number of years. So now they have a huge amount of, um, uh, a huge amount of players that are winning for the first time or the second time. You know, it isn't just the same squad from four years ago. So I think they get huge credit for what they've done over the last period of time. Mm -hmm. Again, even like we talk about Ryan Baird, we didn't even talk about him. His first thing he, he does when he comes on is strip the ball yeah. of CJ Stander. You know, so you have to get excited when you see uh, talent coming through and delivering on their talent. Mm. 
No, for sure. Look, I'm, I just mean it's all on, the, the lead off topic in, in most of these conversations over the last 24 hours has been Munster. You know, they are, they well, are, you, they are the story. You're, just, you're putting me in the awkward position. No, no, no. Being an apologist <laughs> for Leinster, you know. But, uh, uh, the, you know the point is, it's, you know, it, it's to their credit that we can all take them for granted a little bit. But I mean, their, their domination is brilliant. But what the, the question is, and what's really interesting is, uh, just like last year, they are not overly put under pressure throughout the season. I mean, even in Champions Cup this year, the last time we saw them in Europe was at home to Northampton and that was kind of a comfortable enough outing and they were missing Johnny Sexton that day and missing others that day. And, you know, they're very comfortable winners. I guess Tom and Park, they were put under a bit of pressure in January and came through that. But uh, the, the interesting thing for them now is knockout rugby in Europe starts. That's how they judge themselves. And we felt, or certainly you guys felt talking to you after the Saracens game uh, last season, they hadn't been tested enough in the build-up to that game. They hadn't been on the back foot enough in the build-up to that game. And the, obviously their scrum faltered and it's very hard to win a game uh, regardless there. But, you know, the um, slightly pessimistic Leinster fan could be looking at this season and saying, have we been tested enough going into these knockout games? So based on what you've seen from Leinster thus far this season, are they a better team? Are they in better shape? Obviously, it helps not having their uh, bogey and Saracens hanging around, but Exeter will be there. So what's your what's your sense on where Leinster are in some ways as their season really starts now? I think they're in a little bit better shape. I, I also think that last season took an awful lot of getting used to. And if you looked at uh, Pro 14 matches or Heineken Cup matches uh, in the autumn, uh, but they were fairly. some of those were fairly lacklustre. Then the internationals were pretty lacklustre. Um, I think the game has sparked up an awful lot more since then. So mm. we saw some cracking matches in the Six Nations. We're seeing some great games being played over in England, uh, high scoring, very, very fast. I think there's a change uh, into that. I think a good battle for a team that they've just had against Munster, it means that they've won and they didn't do everything right. They're taking nothing for granted. I think they can sharpen up in these weeks to, to get the most out of themselves if... if I mean, they need to get the win, but um, I think they have matured. I think the players that are come in have matured more. I think Porter is a much better player than he was 12 months ago. I think, you know, if Kelleher, who isn't just coming on the scene, he's now played some international games. Yeah. Um, some of the younger guys ha have, I think, have got th their head around what pressure is a, a bit more, but... Look, my fear always when these things happen, that when it's a little bit easier, or it has been easy for Leinster, is to take it for granted. I don't think Leinster took it for granted in this Pro uh, Pro 14. I, do, I just don't think they did. I thought they, um, I thought they consistently pushed their standard and their score, um, and the vast majority was over 50, 50 points. No, they'd be put under pressure, but they're still going to try and make certain that that counts for something. Mm. Well, it'll be an interesting couple of weeks. So it'll be, as you said, uh, Toulon this Friday and they'll get through that, we suspect, and then probably Exeter in the semi-final and that's a different kettle of fish. I mean, there's, yes, look, it's knockout rugby and it seems to have been a season that's gone on forever. We haven't been to the matches, but they have been in bubbles, training, the difficulty with COVID testing, how, how that makes everything uh, and the limiting everything that you do. And of course, we're all limiting it as well, but we're not trying to go up and play matches at the same time and it's I think it's been a very stressful year for all the players um, and I think it's a pretty tough uh, time but I think those players would be excited because they get a chance to go back to their province mm. for Munster I think it's a bit different for, for the weekend um, they need to get their mojo back very quickly and they need to start firing a few shots What does the head say about Munster against Toulouse? I think Toulouse are a better team um, the head says the same. I mean, the heart always says they, they think uh, that it thinks Munster can pull something out of the bag and somehow kick something back into gear and and get the result that's required. Um, the heart will always go that way, but the head doesn't see that at the moment. I, I just I just wanted Munster to do more um, um, mm. at the weekend. And, and, and do you know what? It's This is a thing that annoys me because it's kind of something I would have said 20 years ago you'd say, well, the performance doesn't really matter. Um, it Sometimes it does matter, actually, because if the result is the same from having not really tried to express yourself as a team, well, then you have to change something. So you have to try and get that performance 
and I think actually fans would have would have been able to take the loss if yeah. if Munster had actually shown an awful lot more and risked certain things. It almost seems to be a fear of any risk. Yeah. The funny thing is, the sense was they were moving in that direction all season. Yeah, all season, but then the big matches come. Yeah. So you have to you, you have, have to do to it do, there as well. You have to do it in the big matches. So look, it, it's. I still think Munster have an ability to turn things around because they've done it and have done it consistently. Mm. Um, and I, it's it's like you can pretend and say, well, I know Munster will definitely lose and, and, and then be delighted when they win and you're happy either which way. But um, I think it's a tough one for Munster to get up um, again. I think they have to get up and they have to perform, whether that's good enough for a victory. Um, for me, I, I don't know. I just I don't think so because I don't think that they, um, I don't think they showed the spark that was required at the weekend. Okay, well, like I said, you'll be there with Neil calling the game yeah. for us here and off the ball, so yeah. it should be. I mean, very engaging well, I'm as well. well yeah, I'm I mean, it'll be good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I've I've been to one game since um, uh, since COVID, um, and we we ca called a monster game. Yeah. Look, I. I I want this to be exciting. It's, it's uh, again, of course, it's a shame there's nobody there and there can't be anybody there. Um, will that also act against Munster and kind of Toulouse won't have to deal with the pain mm. of the mm. of the fans or, or whatever it is? But um, you know, what can like what can Munster take out of the game at the weekend into this one? Well, it's that they absolutely try and play. And because um, they're going to be under pressure here too, mm. so how are they going to go about it? And um, if they can make a change to defensive systems to make certain that it's um, that they're able to put enough pressure on, that they're not being sucked into dummy runners, that they're not being beaten easily on the outside, that they're not being um, uh, that they are able to get enough players on the open side when there's a, a cutback from twelve or thirteen. Um, they need to do all those things and they need to try and use the ball when they get it and for me that's what I'd be hoping for don't kick it all away um, use it for a while and see what happens put the pressure on the opposition team OK we'll see how it all goes at the weekend Keith thanks a mil cheers Brilliant. cheers Joe Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone official sponsors of the Irish rugby team team of us everyone in